Foreign policy is considered Prime Minister Narendra Modi's biggest success in his two plus years in office. Under him, we've seen a tactical and strategic shift being conducted uh, in our foreign policy, as well as a change in the manner in which this entire uh, crucial aspect of our nation's outreach has been conducted. And we now have a book that documents this journey in great detail, actually 21 essays under the title, The Modi Doctrine. I have with me three key contributors to this book, each of whom have a direct link to how this Prime Minister has carried out his foreign policy outreach. With me here in Delhi, Vijay Chothaiwale, in charge of the BJP's Foreign Affairs Department. Uh, along with him is Anirban uh, Ganguly, the director of the Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee uh, research Foundation. Both of them are editors in this collection of essays in the Modi Doctrine. And joining me from London, Manoj Ladwa, the author of an essay in the book and the spearhead of PM Modi's community outreach uh, globally, including the United Kingdom, as well as in the historic 2014 election. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, being here with us. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the viewers um, uh, 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 must be wondering uh, and, and seeking more details about what has been uh, uh, written in this book. And uh, just to sort of cite 21 uh, essays, and they come from a whole lot of people, including uh, experts in this space uh, who, who, have, who have followed India's diplomacy and its foreign policy for years now. Uh, and there are chapters dedicated to individual issues, obviously, within, within that book. Uh, but the first question I had, and, and this is more of a, uh, a, a sort of a trick question, probably. Uh, there's a chapter on pretty much um, every Indian neighbor except Pakistan. What happened? Did, did, did that got uh, lo lost in print? What happened? Why didn't the Pakistan chapter come in? I guess it was too obvious. <laughs> we wanted to talk something which is not so obvious. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Manoj, uh, 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 since you were there in London and, uh, uh, and you know, uh, India's foreign policy for years was defined by uh, two things. One was non-alignment uh, and, and the second was this this difficulty of being either in the Soviet axis and therefore being seen in the anti-US axis, and much of that has changed. Um, you are sitting in London. Uh, uh, you, you yourself uh, connect with a whole lot of people all around the world uh, with regard to India. I want to focus on, on, on that one point, uh, the chapter that you yourself uh, wrote about, economic diplomacy. Uh, and towards the end of it, uh, uh, you, you say that the jury is still out as far as the impact of that outreach is concerned. Um, what were you referring to with that remark? Well, um, Siddharth, first of all, I think you're absolutely right to uh, make reference to uh, the non-aligned uh, movement. And I suppose that typified uh, an India that was um, less engaged, um, more uh, working within itself rather than reaching out to its friends uh, across the world. So you're seeing a huge shift uh, in uh, India's diplomacy. It's, uh, as Arun Jaitley in the forward uh, refers to, it's a go-getting diplomacy, which, which puts India, uh, rightly so, at the centre of its um, uh, outreach programme. But specifically, my point about uh, the jury is still out, um, diplomacy doesn't, is not an event. It doesn't happen uh, today and it's gone tomorrow. It's an ongoing process. And therefore, uh, I, I feel that the real assessment will happen within two, three, four, five, ten years' time as to what actually has been achieved. And I think history will judge this period um, very, very positively. Manoj, one quick follow-up uh, up to that point before I come to my uh, guests here. Uh, you know, uh, in the run-up to 2014, um, I have had the occasion to travel with the then Prime Minister and for, for many multilateral engagements um, where you would see the manner in which India was perceived. You would get to hear from uh, foreign diplomats. You would, in, in fact, even get to interact with the foreign press to that extent. That opportunity is not uh, available in that manner, but I have been with you at a couple of the major uh, events. Uh, some detractors have said that much of the diaspora outreach has been more, uh, you know, sound and, uh, and, and dance and song and drama and a, a, an event 
which does not necessarily translate into concrete outcomes with regard to foreign policy. Um, uh, is that an assessment that you would concur with? Uh, no, absolutely not. I think uh, it, it, Prime Minister Modi and this government has recognized that the diaspora is an in, important integral limb of India's uh, foreign policy. Uh, there are 20 million people of Indian origin that um, reside outside uh, of India, many of whom are in very influential positions, be it in government, uh, be it in um, the social sector, uh, and of course in business. Um, this is uh, probably one of India's strongest uh, limbs of uh, its engagement with the world. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, Prime Minister Modi has been absolutely right. And it's not something that he's concocted um, ju just as he woke up in the morning. It's something that he did uh, whilst he was uh, chief minister uh, of the state of Gujarat to engage with the then Gujarati diaspora and now with the global Indian diaspora. And it's uh, and you can see the fruits of that in the um, not only the enthusiasm, the fact that uh, the diaspora in various countries become the reference point for engagement with India through their respective governments. So uh, it's a great thing that that's happened and something that's quite refreshing as well. Uh, fair point there. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Anirban, first. And um, this is, uh, you know, uh, I asked uh, you about the exclusion of the Pakistan chapter, but but let's let's not talk about Pakistan. We'll get there. Uh, uh, you know, China is watching India's future with 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 great curiosity, uh, and and the manner in which our engagement and outreach with China has been conducted over the last two years has led observers to believe that a strategic shift of sorts is underway. Uh, yet there seem to be continuing tensions. How would the, the, the China-India equation be seen uh, uh, currently? How do you yourself view it at this point of time? You see, I have mentioned it in my uh, chapter. And for me, the template for India-China engagement was given by Prime Minister Modi when he addressed the students at the Tsinghua University mm. during his visit to China last year. Mm. And uh, I think that was a historic speech which has uh, set uh, the momentum for the next two decades for India-China engagement. And it's very interesting where uh, Prime Minister Modi says that we need to look at ourselves, both China and India, as two great ancient civilizations who cannot be part of any power blocks. And we need to also recognize that there are a number of powers w which are emerging in the world today. The world is much more interconnected. And we need to base our terms of engagement on that realization. Right. So it was at the same time, at the same time, he also made it clear that there was no intention to brush under the carpet the contentious issues, histo historically the contentious issues. These needed to be addressed. But at the same time, we needed to recognize that as two civilizations, we were apart. Hmm. We had our own, we have our own distinct identity, hmm. our civilizational march, and based on that, we need to reinvent our ties in the current context. Uh, is that reinvention underway? Certainly, certainly. And, 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 and do you, would you say that the lack of uh, concrete developments is just a matter of time? Uh, uh, because, you know, it, it would take time to solve some of the old historical issues. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when uh, he, uh, when Prime Minister Modi appointed the NSA as interlocutor for the border talks, there was a great degree of seriousness in what was happening. Hmm. And so definitely these are uh, two years, there has been a march forward. Uh, certain things have been made extremely clear that the relationship can't be I have not used the word held hostage, but the relationship can't be stymied to a certain past historical issues. They need to be taken forward. And Prime Perhaps Minister Modi was time very will, It will take time it because, will. you know, you, you have had for decades the two countries not being able even to agree on what is a map, what is a absolutely, border. So, so. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but, you know, I, I want to come to something which is more contemporary. And this is, uh, this panned out um, just as your book was about to hit the bookstores. This was two separate, um, uh, almost consecutive speeches and remarks by the Prime Minister. Uh, one at the all-party meeting on Kashmir, the, and the other one was uh, in the Independence Day address. This huge strategic shift 
um, uh, uh, with regard to Pakistan, perhaps our biggest foreign policy concern, I would say. I think beyond our immediate neighborhood, there are no concerns uh, across the world. And your, your book, for instance, uh, provides uh, very, very important nuggets. For instance, um, the, uh, uh, somewhere in 2015, mid of 2015, uh, India decided to almost increase by 60 odd percent the number of defense attaches, uh, which is a fact which was not known 70 odd to 110. But but you know I'm digressing. Uh, on Pakistan, on Balochistan, uh, is this is this a political gambit? Uh, is this part of the structured diplomacy, uh, or did it emanate from the BJP's foreign affairs de department? No, no, it's definitely <laughs> not my contribution. It is uh, the government's prerogative to set the agenda. But coming back, see, there is history. The history starts with the Sharm el Sheikh statement between Manmohan Singh and Prime Minister of Pakistan, which basically put back our uh, position to a great extent, where we said that India said that we will, con uh, the terrorism and the talks. Uh, cannot be linked and therefore both the things can, in a way saying that we will talk in spite of there is a cross-border terrorism. And the second part which is equally important that Pakistan has, uh, India has indirectly acknowledged that India has some role in Balochistan insurgency. That was indirect reference in that statement. And that made India's statement, India's position very weak. Mm. Now on that background if we see today, uh, the. Prime Minister Modi has put the records in straight. Number one, he is saying that when we say India, uh, when we say Kashmir, mm. we also mean that Pak occupied Kashmir, and we have all party resolution in the parliament of that effect. Right. So he is not saying something new. But UPA government was actually uh, resisting or being hesitant to say it for last ten years. The second part is equally important that, as far as Balochistan is concerned. We are talking mainly about the human rights abuses in Balochistan. Pakistan is talking all about the human rights in Jammu and Kashmir, etc., etc. But at their own backyard, what's happening is that hundreds and thousands of people have been displaced. There are more than 20,000 deaths. There are un in uncounted number of rapes, uh, abduction of women, and Pakistan doesn't want to talk about it. Okay, so so since you're saying Pakistan doesn't want to talk about it, let's again get the international perspective here. Um, uh, Manoj, I have with me, um, you know, a, a, a couple of um, newspaper uh, articles, including one by the former Minister for External Affairs, Salman Khurshid, uh, uh, with the headline, Adventurism on Independence Day, linking POK with Balochistan is a myopic move would in undermine India's high moral ground vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. I also have another cutting which says, uh, bluster or master stroke depends on what the government does uh, and this this article cites several ex diplomats uh, how would this pan out uh, this, this strategic shift that has been conducted with regard to the pok uh, baluchistan gilgit baluchistan uh, uh, question how would this pan out for instance in the uk parliament or in the in the uk media intelligentsia well i think uh, india is um, the superpower in the region it is uh, an interested uh, uh, um, entity within the region. And to that extent, uh, India is absolutely right in uh, raising issues of concern. And um, one issue of concern is terrorism. Now, terrorism does not have any color. It does not have any shade. Terrorism is terrorism. And whether that terrorism is um, uh, across the border from Pakistan into India or it's, it's in Balochistan, I think... Um, the international community uh, is united uh, broadly on the issue of uh, terror and stamping out terror and the causes of terror wherever they are and whoever sponsors it. So um, uh, you would have seen that um, though there were some people on the fringes, I would say, uh, in Indian politics now that, that raised the, uh, raise these particular points, um, Broadly speaking, the international community uh, ha has um, uh, reacted in the way in which you would expect it to react, that it is um, considering India as a mature partner and that um, its concerns are a concern that um, uh, the rest of the world should also take note of. Uh, Vijay, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, uh, as far as Mr. Sarman Khurshid is concerned, he is more or less saying, uh, Mehuna. 
okay. uh, <laughs> kind of thing because I'm trying to prove his, uh, his relevance because there is another interview yesterday or today in uh, the Telegraph Calcutta where he was asked that your statement has been contradicted by the official spokesperson. Uh, Mr. Surjiwala, and uh, to that reply, he said, Ki well, but I am the senior most person, uh, spokesperson in about the foreign policy. So I am still I am still there, and this is my statement. So he is directly contradicting so-called official Congress uh, position. And so we don't know what Congress stands for now, whether he stands yeah. with Surman Kurshid or with Mr. Surjewala. And they are right. in the in fact, total that is confusion. Out, uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the official party line yeah. and of individual speakers it's has been different from different. the Congress. Yeah. And you know, I want to make a point here. It's very strange I'm, I'm, uh, that the Congress today is taking this line or whoever in the Congress is taking this line. But let us all recall how Mrs. Gandhi was very strident on Baluchistan. So is the Congress giving up on Mrs. Gandhi's stand on Baluchistan? Right. I'm surprised. Uh, perhaps or the other reason is they don't even know their history, which goes back <laughs> just 20 years. <laughs> I okay. would have loved to continue with that, but then, you know, I'll be accused of not having a Congress voice on the show. <laughs> and no. this is not... So, yeah. so let's come back to the Modi doctrine. But, uh, you know, and, and the, the other bi uh, big point, uh, because we were talking about the outreach and what has happened, and this is, uh, this is the relationship and the outreach that... Prime Minister Modi has uh, attempted with the United States of America. Uh, several foreign policy experts say that it has been a natural progression of sorts uh, uh, from what was uh, attempted by the previous administration and because uh, foreign policy is also about continuity and not radical departures. Uh, we have seen Prime Minister Narendra Modi invest a lot of time on the relationship with the United States and its current administration. Uh, Vijay, I'm going to come to you first and then, uh, the, and then all of you. My question is very simple. Has the United States reciprocated India's and Prime Minister Modi's outreach? I think uh, you need to see it from the second term of uh, Clinton's administration, Bill Clinton's second term. And there is a continuum. Initially, they were slow. Uh, they, uh, they were trying to understand the potential, but they were always thinking that we go two step forward and three step backward because India is not moving. And therefore, they were cautious. Of course, the civil nuclear agreement with India was the great step, and we must congratulate both Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh and uh, Mr. Bush for that. But what Modi ji has done, is that he has not only said that he is willing partner, but also he has galvanized the entire state <coughs> machinery behind it. And therefore, there are collaborations are happening in every sector. And therefore, I think that now there is a momentum uh, between India and US relationship, which is going to a next level. OK, it's going to the next level. Uh, Anirban, I don't know if you want to come in, but I just want to. Uh, uh, Manoj, I wanted to uh, ask you that similar point. Uh, you know, uh, the, our relationship with the United Kingdom for, for, for long before 2014, 2015 almost had been defined by one case of, um, uh, you know, alleged tax terrorism and, and uh, with one of the largest mobile phone companies in the world. Uh, a lot of water has passed down uh, both the Thames and the Gangaji since then. Substantially, uh, uh, ha have material differences been made with regard to our our relationship with the United Kingdom, which you would agree uh, sort of had had suffered for for some period of time. I, I think so. The mood music has definitely uh, uh, changed, and um, uh, you know. One talks about special relationships around the world, uh, and uh, India has now developed um, a, a number of very special uh, relationships. But uh, I, I'd contend that still uh, the UK-India uh, relationship is uh, the deepest of uh, uh, relationships across uh, the, the gamut of um, uh, diplomacy, politics, uh, and economics uh, as well. Uh, India is uh, the... Um, third largest investor into the United Kingdom. The UK cumulatively is the largest investor uh, into uh, India. And, and therefore, uh, that, that depth of um, cooperation and relationship is something that just uh, isn't going to uh, go away. What you found in uh, Prime Minister Modi and um, uh, Vijay uh, Ji 
uh, alluded to this, is that he's created a step change in that relationship, that go-getter relationship that um, uh, uh, Arun Jaitley wrote so eloquently in his forward in the book uh, as well. So, uh, yes, the mood music has changed, but it's uh, in every single aspect of the uh, relationship, uh, wh whether it's in the pharmaceutical sector, within the healthcare sector, in education, in defense, in various other strategic roles, and also uh, at a multilateral uh, level as well. The relationship between the UK and India, I would say, has quick, never been. Quick point, quick, quick interjection I wanted, Manoj, with you. Uh, you know, your, your, your country right now is 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 grappling with uh, the brexit and also has a, had a change of administration um, obviously there will be a bilateral visit uh, either ways but uh, do, do, do you do you see some something um, uh, you know uh, in your assessment do you see uh, the the attention of the uk administration being devoted to the relationship uh, with india uh, uh, you know taking importance uh, for the next few months, or do, would you see the impact of the Brexit making uh, that administration look more inwards? No, actually, I think the uh, uh, if, if you if you see that uh, since Brexit, and uh, uh, I think India uh, uh, made it very clear that it would have rather um, um, Britain remain within the European than outside. But once the British public voted. Um, India has been very open and uh, forthcoming in in engaging with the United Kingdom, and um, you, you've seen a series of uh, ministerial visits from the United Kingdom, which will culminate in, uh, I believe, Theresa May uh, coming out to India uh, within the next uh, um, short period as well. Um, I, 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 I sense uh, a UK that is outward looking and would be looking at India as one of its um, uh, golden opportunities. And therefore, there's an, there's an opportunity to be seized. Uh, India will need to um, consider its, um, uh, its options and its relationship, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the free trade agreement negotiations, will no doubt, that will no doubt follow. But um, there's nothing that I've seen that is a negative or inward looking. Um, Britain is open for business and India is an important uh, partner in that and that's been made very clear by both sides. Absolutely. Uh, Anirban, I'm, uh, I'm coming to you. Um, uh, I, I read again uh, today on, on Twitter that uh, Imran Khan of the Tehrike Insaf Party of Pakistan has hit out at Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan. Uh, saying that he is not as enthusiastic as when it comes to foreign policy as Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and even alluding to the constant travels that the Prime <laughs> Minister has done. But but my question uh, is is connected to that, and this is about the the, the triple S sort of message: Sanskriti, uh, Sabhyata, and Samvad uh, that has been put out uh, and has been one of the constants of the Prime Minister's uh, outreach. Uh, in terms of substance, uh, how strategic I is it a shift? Because, you know, uh, many of us grew up in our textbooks to read about the Panchil principles and, and uh, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's uh, approach. Uh, from, from a party point of view, uh, is, is this something that um, indicates uh, the BJP's long-term vision when it comes to engaging with the wider world, not just the diaspora, but with the wider world, major, smaller economies all over the world. You see, that has uh, been the hallmark in the last two years. In fact, um, engaging with the unengaged has been a principal hallmark of uh, Prime Minister Modi's policy in the last two years. Mm. Uh, reaching out to the Asia-Pacific heads of states, He's uh, not only in Fiji, but even inviting this, organizing this summit here in Jaipur. This has been an aspect. And then uh, this uh, approach to civilizational connect, reaching out to India's uh, civilizational partners, erstwhile mm. civilizational partners, actively reaching out to them, and then reinventing the wheel mm. in the current context. These have been very systematically done, and these are there to stay uh, for quite some time now. In fact, this is a relaying of uh, the foreign policy vision of India. Panchil served a certain purpose. It had a certain uh, relevance in a certain context. And even there, it did not serve it so well. And so today, we have this Panchamrit, 
which has the component of dialogue, of active reaching out, of engaging, and of revitalizing the civilization and cultural connect. Because India in the past was a global lighthouse, it cannot be denied. And India today, under Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy rubric, seeks to again rediscover herself as that global light. And, and, and the choice of gifts that uh, Prime Minister exchanges is perhaps symbolic of that. Mm -hmm. uh, la la last uh, uh, couple of minutes, uh, Vijay, and I want to uh, really ask you um, about this. Uh, the, the vision that the party, and this is important for our viewers to understand, a cadre based party like the Bharti Janta Party with, with the Rashtri Swam Sevak Sangh as the sort of uh, uh, umbrella uh, uh, organization. Uh, there has been a vision within the RSS, its affiliates, it has had an international wing for decades now. How much of that is translating? Because ultimately diplomacy uh, is not conducted by the party. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is Absolutely. conducted by the formal structures and organs of diplomacy. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, do you see that 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 cadre is keeping pace with with this new vision and its articulation? I think uh, they are more or less in sync. Of course, foreign policy decisions and the strategy is being developed and executed by the experts, which is uh, which are there in the government. But the vast diaspora uh, outside India, as well as those who are in India, uh, are in sync with that. See, the whole theme is uh, has been encapsulated by Prime Minister Modi recently when he said that the principle of my foreign policy is India first. Hmm. And as long as that principle is in place, I don't think any cadre or any Parivar organization should have any issue about it. As long as inter India's interests are paramount and they are taken care of, the entire uh, cadre are fully supportive of Prime Minister Modi, and so is the diaspora. Absolutely, so is the diaspora. So um, uh, th those are the three three key people who have had. Uh, uh, you know, uh, important roles in, in setting this new doctrine in place and as the backdrop and uh, the, the front of this book shows, uh, even, the, even the picture that has been chosen is very symbolic. Prime Minister Modi addressing uh, from the podium at the United Nations General, General Assembly. Uh, and, and you know, make, make what you want to make of the photo, but I, I would say that it's, it seems to represent uh, a new assertive uh, almost muscular form of diplomacy that is being put in place uh, and we'll see perhaps much more of this happening uh, in the weeks, days and months ahead. Uh, Manoj Ladwa, uh, Anirban Ganguly, Vijay Chothaiwala, thank you very much for your time to discuss the Modi thank Doctrine. You. So that thank is a wrap on this show. Thank you.